Come Holy Spirit right now and heal. The Holy Spirit ain't here to just put you up and down. He's here to deal with your past in such a way that it doesn't stop your future. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. That once you come to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God. Genesis 32, verses 24, this is, this is, I think, a quintessential moment in the life of Jacob. This is the moment where he allows the Holy Spirit to change him. Read with me. I'm reading from the NIV. I'm going to be reading about eight verses. Read with me. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Another translation says his hip was dislocated as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, let me go because we have wrestled all night and the day is coming or it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, deceiver, supplanter, cheater, manipulator. My name is manipulator. My past is manipulator. I am emotionally immature, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be cheater, supplanter, manipulator, emotional, immature. But Israel, prince of God, because you have had the courage to struggle with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, what's your name? Please tell me. But he replied, why do you ask my name? He blessed him there. Jacob called the name of the place face of God, Peniel, saying, because I saw the face of God face to face and my life was spared. The sun came up again as he passed through the face of God and he was limping. Say with me, he was limping. Say with me, he was limping. God might cause you to limp so that you can run. He was limping because of his hip. And that's why to this day the Israelites do not eat this. It changed even the diet of the nation. This experience changed the diet of the nation to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. For the next couple of weeks, I imagine here at the 9 a.m. and at the other services here at El Calvario, you're going to hear about brokenness. Say with me, brokenness. What is brokenness? Brokenness is not destruction. I want to clarify that God is not interested in destroying you. And if you collapse brokenness into destruction, you are in a hot mess. God is not interested in destroying you. God is interested in breaking you to make you over again. The devil comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. Christ comes that you might have life and life in abundance. And so the question is, why does God break us? Because there are things in our lives that need renewing, that need reforming, that need reshaping. Say, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people that need renewing, reshaping, reforming, transforming, because we've been conformed to old habits. And Jacob is the quintessential, the paradigmatic example of a hot mess. Some people talk about generational curses. They say, oh my, I have these generational curses. But I believe that more than generational curses, not that I don't believe in generational curses, is learned behavior. That people do things because they learn it from their mom and their dad, their grandma and their grandpa, or the immediate circle. It's what psychologists call the contrast between nature and nurture, environment and DNA. And so Jacob was a liar. Say with me, Jacob was a liar. 
Where'd he pick that up? Where did Jacob pick up lying? Well, Isaac was a liar, his father. Because when there was a famine and when there was a struggle, he said that his wife was his sister. Where did he pick that up? He picked that up from Abraham. Because when there was a famine in the land, Abraham goes down into Egypt. When he's down into Egypt, Pharaoh looks at Sarah. He says, my, she's good looking. And Abraham was afraid, say with me, fear will make you act out of character. Yes, it will. That's why you never act out of fear. Never act out of fear. God is not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So Abraham lies and says, Sarah, well, he, he half truths, which is a lie. He says, Sarah is my sister. When they're about to get the blessing, Jacob deceives his father. Who is complicit in that lie? His mother. They come from a, li a line of liars. And so when the angel asked him, what is your name? Jacob says, my family tradition is that we lie, we cheat to get what we want. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you and I, in our emotional realm, are captive to things because our mommy did it, our daddy did it, our grandmammy did it, and we say that's the way it should be. But God is here to break you from the chains of your genealogy and of your past and make you a better person. Say it to your neighbor, you don't have to stay that way. <laughs> Tell me again, you don't have to stay that way. I've been into pastoral counseling. Pastor Jeanette and I have been in pastoral counseling. And we tell somebody, but why are you like that? And they have the audacity to tell me, I was born that way and I'm going to stay that way. I see you. And, and with the whole head twist, you know, and I'm like, first of all, I'm a little concerned that, with the body language. A little concerned. Second of all, to say that you were born away and you're going to stay that way is to insult the potential of the Holy Spirit for transformation. I'll come over here. To say you were born a certain way and that you can't change is to insult the power of the Holy Spirit to change people. He is the Holy Spirit and he has the capacity to go to the most recondite parts of your life and change you. Nothing is impossible for him. The Holy Spirit is not just here for you to feel the chills, the thrills, and the spills. The Holy Spirit is here to form your character into the person of Jesus. And if you have stuff around you that makes you emotionally mature, the Holy Spirit, if you allow him, will wrestle with you all night long till he pulls that thing out of you. Tell your neighbor, yes, you can change. Touch your husband and say, yes, baby, you can change. Touch your children and say, yes, you can change. There is nothing impossible for the Holy Spirit to come into your character flaws, your emotional mature immaturity, and mature you. Listen to me now. There's going to be a principle coming up on the screen, I hope. Emotional immaturity is a hindrance to spiritual growth. Look at me. Emotional immaturity is a hindrance to spiritual growth. There's a book by Peter Scazzaro called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. We have a lot of people that don't go to their next level because their emotional immaturity holds captive their spiritual potential. I'm coming over here. And although you're 40, 50, 60, 30, emotionally you're 12. Emotionally you're 10. Because a trauma that happened in your life, somebody failed you. Hey, how many of you have been betrayed? If you haven't been betrayed, live a little longer. It's coming. Now, now, now I'm going to ask a deeper question. How many of you have betrayed somebody? Mm, oh. no, I'm going to come over here. I want to come to the truth-telling side of the church. How many of you have betrayed somebody? A and when you betrayed them, you felt bad and you wanted forgiveness. But when somebody else betrayed you, you wanted vengeance. Here's what we have in Genesis chapter 32. In Genesis chapter 32, Jacob is fleeing from Esau. Say with me, Jacob is fleeing from Esau. What's interesting about this is that Jacob and Esau are twins. They're what? What are they? The Bible, every time it introduces a twin in the Old Testament, St. Augustine says that allegorically is showing us a struggle within the soul. I don't, I'll come over here. I'll say that in English. In the Old Testament... 
When the writer introduces twins, St. Augustine says that allegorically, I'll say what that means, metaphorically, I'll say that what that means, symbolically, they are showing a struggle within the soul. And so, Jacob and Esau are a struggle within the soul, the soul of the future of the nation. Some people believe Cain and Abel were twins because in Genesis chapter 3, it says that Adam knew his wife and she conceived Cain and then she conceived Abel without Adam knowing her again. So some people believe Cain and Abel were twins. Jacob and Esau are twins. And what these twins show you is a dynamic of struggle for emotional maturity. Esau was impulsive. Esau sometime was given to temper tantrums. The problem was that Jacob was not divorced from that, and Jacob learned from his older brother the way to get things is by cheating. And so what we have is when Jacob is fleeing from Esau, he's fleeing from himself. He's fleeing from his past. He's fleeing from his emotional scars. Say with me, emotional immaturity can hinder spiritual growth. Why can't some people be corrected? Because they're emotionally immature. Why are they emotionally mature? Because when they were corrected as children and adolescents, it was done wrongly. So now any correction, even if it's right, triggers the wrong correction in their past. I'm, I'm even trying to teach something here. Can I go here? And so some of us grew up in traditions that are legalistic. I, I, you know what that is? Legalistic is making rules that you yourself don't follow even though God didn't create them. Legalism is creating rules that you yourself can't follow and that God did not create. That's legalism. And so you grew up in a tradition that's legalistic. It chastises you. It punishes you. It corrects you. Some of it was excess. But then when you come into a healthy tradition, God corrects you to mature you. You can't take that correction because of the wound of your past. And so somebody that means well is trying to grow you, but because somebody meant poorly before, están pagando los trastes de otro. They're paying the dishes of your past. Tell your neighbor, this year, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit mature me so I can grow. And so you're running, you're running, running. The Bible says he was left alone. He was not left alone, actually. The translation says he was left alone, but the reality was he sent everybody away. Read the text in verses 17 to 21. He sent his wife, you remember this? He said, Esau's persecuting him. What does he do? He sends his wives. He wives. He had wives. He sent his children. Because some of us hide behind our stuff. God wants to get to you. But you hide behind your stuff. But I'm Pastor Salguero. But I have a seminary degree. But I wrote a book. But I have more networks than the CIA. I have more followers than the Beatles. I'm famous. Don't you know who I am? You can't send stuff in front of you when God is trying to change you. Hey, you are not what you do. You are not what you do. You're a doctor. That's not who you are. That's what you do. You're a lawyer. That's not who you are. That's what you do. You're a pastor. That's not who you are. That's what you do. Huh? You're a judge. That's not who you are. That's what you do. Who you are is how God sees you and trying to conform you to the image of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Touch your neighbor and say, I want to be more like Jesus. Touch him again and say, I want to be more like Jesus. But that ain't easy, baby. Being like Jesus ain't easy because it takes a cross. I'll come over here. And so Jacob is fleeing Esau. He's running away, and he's putting stuff in front of him, and God is pursuing him, relentlessly and passionately pursuing him like a lover, pursuing him, and he's left alone. And suddenly a man appears. I remember as a child, we used to sing that, that Jacob wrestled with an angel. The translation says a man. We don't know exactly the dimensions of this man, but when his name refuses to be revealed, we have some interpreters that say it was the, the Christ appearing, what some people call Christophany or Theophany. I don't know, I wasn't there, but I assume that happened. And when he wrestles with him all night long, God touches, God first asks him his name. Look at me. To be healed, confession is a key. To be broken, confession is a key. 
Say with me, confession is a key. Say with me, confession is a key. Now look, you know why most people don't confess their sins? Do you know why most people don't confess their sins? We have confession in the classical tradition of the faith of many of your relatives and of mine. We have that. You know why they're free to confess? Because there's safety in that confession. But we live in a culture where we don't value confession because we no longer have trust. And, and so we don't have confession in the church, and we have to pay therapists whom I believe in. I have a therapist. I go every, every other Wednesday. Please don't call me every first and third Wednesday because I'm taking therapy, probably talking about you so I can get healed. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, thank God our pastors take therapy. The Greek, one of the Greek words for healing is therapuo, healing as a process. Jesus sent the lepers out, and the Bible says, and on their way, they were therapeuoed. They were healed on the way. Because some healing is iasis instantly. Other healing is therapeutic. It takes a process. Because you got so much junk, you got to detox. You got to throw it out. You got to tell your neighbor, therapeuo, be healed in the process. And so you have this thing where, where God wants you to confess. But we live in a culture with violation of confidence. And so nobody trusts anybody, so they don't confess. You want a nation to be broken, you have to reestablish the altar of confession. What is your name? How many of you have a social media account? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Cara Libro, whatever you got. Right? I want you to know something. I'm, I'm going to tell you something that I think is going to bless you. Facebook is not a real reflection of people's lives. I'll come over here. <laughs> Facebook is not a real reflection of my life. Because on Facebook, I don't have Facebook, so don't look for me because you won't find me. I don't have it. Okay? On Facebook, people put their victories. Somebody say yes. They, you know, here I am with Kobe Bryant. Here I am with Pastor Nino. In that picture, Nino is greater than Kobe. I, I, you know, he, he writes the checks. I just want to put, I want to remember my relationship in relation to the crown. <laughs> I was born at night, but not last night. My goal before this year is over is to have Nino laughing, slapping his knee. <laughs> and so we don't confess because there's not trust. And people can't be broken because they can't confess. The second reason people don't confess is because of fear of judgment. I'll come over here. How many of you have stuff you won't tell anybody because you think they'll judge you? And so people can't be broken where there's a culture of condemnation. People cannot be broken where there's a culture of condemnation. Because God breaks you when, he, when you confess, he heals you, and he inspires you to a new level. So, you know, why, why won't I confess? Because if I think all of hell's fury... All of Dante Alighieri's inferno is going to be unleashed on me. I'm not going to confess it to you. And so where, we, where there's a culture of condemnation, it is the antithesis to brokenness. That's why Paul is writing to the church in Rome because the Roman culture was a, a punitive culture. In Rome, they punished everybody. Crucifixion, the Iron Maiden, boiled in oil. And Paul was trying to change their mind. And he would say, now therefore there is no condemnation for them Christ. people will not be broken where there's a culture of condemnation because confession and condemnation work against each other and so God or the person that appears to Jacob I don't have time to enter into that debate appears to him and says confess to me what are you about and immediately because Jacob was alone there was nobody there to judge him there was nobody there to condemn him. he says I'm gonna tell you who I am I'm a liar I'm a cheater I'm a supplanter he wrestles with him all night long. Let me tell you, your emotional immaturity did not happen overnight. Mine didn't either. So sometimes it takes a process to heal it. I want everybody to raise their hand with me right now. And I, I want you to open your heart to the Holy Spirit right now. 
you're alone with God right now. And I want you to, I want you to right now think. The problem sometimes in churches is that we have a lot of time for worship, but very little time for silence. And in silence, God also reveals things. I want you to think of every broken place in your life. Of every wound. Of everything in your past. And I want you to call it by its name. Every trauma. Every time your pride got the better of you. Every time you were angry and sinned because you can be angry and not sin. Every time your impulses, your sexual appetite, your temperament got the better of you. Right now is your Peniel moment and you're standing in the face of God. In the face of God, there's transformation but not condemnation. Come Holy Spirit now. Come Holy Spirit right now now and heal begin the process of healing of anger of pride of low self-esteem of insufficiency come holy spirit and give us our peniel moment our face-to-face -face moment because we can't go where we're going till we visit it where we've been come right now so whether you're two or 102 come holy spirit heal say with me i receive confrontation and forgiveness i receive confrontation and forgiveness god confronts me to forgive me amen i want to give you a second principle as i get ready to close god heals you by confronting your history and your past now look not everything in your past is bad. How many of you have good things in your past? Good memories, right? So God confronts you with that to celebrate that and build on that. And things that are broken in your past, God confronts it so you don't repeal it or repeat it. And so your past is not just bad. If your past is only bad, it is not a problem of your past. It's a problem of how you frame your past. If your past, if everything you remember about your past is bad, it's not a problem just of your past. It's also a problem of how you frame your past. If you can't have one good memory of your past, somebody said good morning, somebody said hello, it is not a problem with your past. It's a problem of how you frame your past. I want to give you a spiritual principle. I am a pastor's kid, and now I'm a pastor, okay? I'm a PK who became a P, and now has PKs. And I'm going to tell you a gift my mother gave me and my father gave me. Every time they had a conflict in church, every time somebody backstabbed them, they would come up to me and say, don't you ever forget that God is good. And don't you ever forget that people make mistakes and you do too. Learn grace. Learn grace. Because if you learn grace, if you learn grace, if you are not a castigating, punitive, retributive person, if you learn grace, you receive grace. And so I, my mother said, bitterness does not have space in this house. How many of you are bitter around some things that people did to you? Okay, I'll come over here. The truth telling side of the church. How many of you have ever been bitter? I'm not saying now. I, I, you just had that prayer, so you're a little bit past that. But you've been bitter in your past. You want to slap somebody five ways from Tuesday. I know this is a holy church, but I'm saying, you ever had a moment? I'm not saying now. I know you got baptized. You just had communion. You know, you just had the prayer. But you just wanted to slap somebody in the Tuesday. And Wednesday and Thursday. What is bitterness? Bitterness is the capacity to not forgive. I can't forgive. And so, Jacob comes from a whole history of sibling rivalry. Isaac and Ishmael, right? Lot and Abraham. He comes from a history where everybody's fighting. And so at this moment, he has to learn to walk differently. Spirituality, brokenness is the capacity to say, I used to walk this way and it wasn't working for me. I used to walk this way and it was not the will of God for me. Oh, that God would visit me in Peniel and break my leg so I could learn again. 
And so people are bitter. Other people don't have that problem. Other people are spoiled. I know that not here, but in New York, they're spoiled folks, you know? Right? They think they, they deserve everything. Have you, anybody run against a spoiled person? Anybody ever act spoiled? I'll come over here to the truth-telling side. Anybody ever act spoiled? Right? This, this culture of entitlement, I deserve it. We deserve death, but we got heaven. We deserve punishment, but we got grace. We deserve God's wrath, but we got God's mercy. It's not about what we deserve. It's about the goodness of God that never fails us. His mercies are new every morning. If it were not for his love, we would all be consumed. And so we have, on one hand, people who are bitter, people who are angry. On the other hand, people who are entitled and people who are spoiled. All of them need to come to the face of God. It is only in the face of God that you really know who you are. It is only in the face of God that you know who you really are. Let me just close with this. This phrase in Genesis 32, and Jacob wrestled all night long. Listen to me. There are things that you can be delivered from instantly, on the moment. There are other things, they are so deeply rooted that you need a process of transformation. Give me an example, Pastor. I'm so glad you asked me. When Simon starts to follow Jesus, Simon, son of Jonah, you later know him as Peter. He starts to follow Jesus. He's an impulsive person. What kind of person is he? Now, three years later, he's still walking with Jesus. They come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Pressure. Because when you're under pressure, your real deep feelings come out. When you're under pressure, in Puerto Rico they say, te sale el monstruo. Anybody? Anybody, you, you, you vent when you're under pressure. I'll come over here with the truth-telling side of the church. Anybody, under pressure is like, boom. You're volcanic. Beast mode, you're out. Right? And you, and you become, right? It's because that is reflecting a trigger so deep inside you still have not dealt with. And so that thing, Takes a process of the Holy Spirit. Three years, Jesus is teaching Simon. Simon, Simon, this, this. He gets impulsive. He wants to rebuke the children. He gets impulsive. He wants to bring fire down from heaven. Three years later, they come to arrest Jesus. The trigger comes out in Peter. <laughs> Malchus's ear comes right off. Some people said he was trying to kill Malchus. The only thing is that Malchus moved and he cut off his ear, but he was going for his head. Why did that come out? Because that was deeply ingrained in Peter. He was impulsive. Under pressure, he would either be angry or be fearful. Either one, he was impulsive. But when the day of Pentecost comes, mm, it comes upon Simon, and there were other people there. The Bible says Simon stood up. Because the Holy Spirit had gone into the recondite parts, the, the hidden parts, the most inter interior parts where sometimes therapy can't go, where sometimes pastoral counseling can't go, sometimes the best books by your famous writers can't go, oh, because you, because you haven't allowed him to go. Let me be clear, sometimes God uses books, sometimes God uses therapy, and it's still God. God has a multiform manifestation. God could come to you in many ways, and it's still God. It could be a wind, it could be a fire. It could be a whirlwind or it could be a whisper as long as you can discern that God is working here. How many of you have potential? That was an amen time. How many of you know God has a purpose for you? But something in your character stopped you from reaching it. That has I've lost opportunities because of my temperament. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Too quick to speak. Anybody quick to speak? Anybody? Tell me something. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the Bible says be slow to speak and quick to listen. I've lost opportunities because I'm quick. Right? I've lost opportunities because somebody said something to me. I interpreted it through my past and it got triggered and I wanted to kill that person. That person doesn't even have a clue. They're like, where is this coming from? 
What happened to Pastor Gabe? What you don't know is that you remind me of my, my uncle so-and-so who did that to me when I was 11. You're not, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at my uncle. You just happen to be the channel that re represents him. There's nobody, that, no one's ever done that. No one has ever done that. You're arguing with your wife, but you're really arguing with your mother. <laughs> Touch three people and say, the Holy Spirit goes there. The Holy Spirit ain't here to just put you up and down. He's here to deal with your past in such a way that it doesn't stop your future. Tell your neighbor, break me, break me, break me, break me. Take my hip out and make me walk different. This is the year where I'm going to deal with the stuff I didn't deal with before. Say with me, God confronts your past and he heals you. God shatters Jacob so Israel can be born. God shatters Jacob. So Israel can be born. There are things. I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. And I imagine that if it's me, I'm not alone. There are things with which we have to wrestle all night long. How many of you have come to the altar repenting for something on Sunday and on Monday you go right back to it. I'm not talking to anybody. I, that's just me. I, I'm the only one who's done that. You come, Lord, Lord, I don't want to be so angry. I, you, re, you, 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 you repent, but then you go back and you're struggling with the same thing. The devil lies to you and says you haven't gotten better. But what you're going to need to tell the devil this morning is I'm going to wrestle with that all night long. The prophet Micah says, do not be glad against me, my enemy. He's talking to his flesh. Because although I fell, I will arise. And although I dwelt in darkness, the Lord shall be my light. If seven times the righteous fall, that means to tell you that righteous people can fall. It doesn't say if seven times the sinner falls. It says if the righteous fall. Any righteous ever fall in here? Any righteous person wrestle with stuff and you, you're like, you're blubbering all over yourself on Sunday. You know, you got that cry. And Monday, that thing comes on you like a bear. And the devil says, yeah, see, you haven't defeated it. Tell the devil, I'm a step closer now. And next Sunday, devil, I'm going back to the altar. And the Sunday after that, I'm going right back. Because there are things you got to wrestle all night long. I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Soto I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To fix families. To repair character. To give wisdom. To shape temperament. To break hips. And so this morning I, I'm going to ask, is there a Jacob in the house who wants to become Israel? Is there somebody courageous enough to say, God, in 2016, I'm going to wrestle with the things I've left unaddressed. And I can't do it on my own. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Jacob, if you're out there and you want Israel to come out, come now. The Holy Spirit is here to minister to you. I want to pray for you. Come on now. Hey, if you don't know Jesus, this is your, this is your morning of transformation. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. The hidden things. Stuff that, you know, stuff that has embarrassed you. There's people that won't be free because the devil shames them. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Jesus became shame for you at the cross so that you could live in the light. But you don't know what I've done, Pastor. God knows and he still loves you. Bring your husband, bring your wife, bring your children. Come by yourself. Single, divorce. But I have a divorce in my past. 
That's not beyond the grace of God. But I have fornication in my past. That's not beyond the grace of God. But I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen. That's not beyond the grace of God. Ask sin if grace is not greater. The pastors are going to help me pray with people this morning. This is the year of the Holy Ghost. Pastor Rasky said last week, it's the year of fire. And fire does two things. It lights and it burns. It illuminates and it destroys germs. There are giants with which you've wrestled that shall haunt you no more. Come, Holy Spirit. God, you know I'm angry. I have this anger, this bitterness. Come, Holy Spirit, heal. In the place of anger, resentment, and bitterness, put healing, grace, forgiveness. God, I'm so proud. It's all about me. Holy Spirit, come in that place and bring humility, sensibility, and sensitivity to the Holy Ghost. Help me to remember my relationship in reference to the crown. God, I want to tell you that if I fail, I'm not going to give up on this. If it rears its ugly head again, I'm not going to relent. Come Holy Spirit now. The gospel is not only words, but Paul says that the gospel is power. to Christ, that question is settled. You are a son of God.